In today's world, video is everywhere. You are an app developer, and you want to wow your users. But how do you create the detailed, fine-tuned media magic that you have envisioned? I am Lajos from the Android Video Framework team, and I'm going to talk about how to create great, even impressive multimedia experiences on Android. Sure, Android has great high-level media APIs, but if you want to do something other than playing or capturing video, or you need a feature that is not supported by media player or media recorder, you will need to get down and dirty with the nuts and bolts of Android Media, the low-level APIs. They consist of the media codec that is used to both decode compress audio and video and to encode raw audio and video. Media Extractor parses media container files into audio and video packets. Conversely, Media Muxer packages audio and video packets into a media container. Media Crypto and Media DRM are used to decrypt protected media content and to manage the digital rights. You can do everything that Media Player and Media Recorder does using the low-level APIs. I know it because we did it. For example, to build a media player, you need two media codec objects and a media extractor to parse the individual audio and video packets out of the data source. To playback secure content, you will need a media DRM object to manage the secure session. And you will need to provide a media crypto object to the video decoder. You can implement media recorder using two media codecs and a media muxer. In fact, you can build a wide variety of multimedia applications, and might I add, quite cool ones, when you combine these media blocks with others, such as textures and texture shaders. For example, this is how you could do video editing, as it is done in Auto Awesome Movie in Google+. Decode the two source videos onto GL textures, composite them using GLES shaders onto the input surface of a video encoder. Voila, that was easy. So how do media codecs work? Media codec, at its core, is a signal processor that produces output data from input data. It is processing data asynchronously and uses a set of input and output buffers. At a simplistic level, the client requests an empty input buffer, fills it up with data, and sends it to the codec for processing. The codec uses up the data and transforms it into one of its empty output buffers. Finally, the client requests a filled output buffer, consumes its contents, and sends it back to the codec. The real operation of a codec is a little more complex, as each of these operations is happening in parallel. Also, codecs that produce raw video buffers can be connected to a surface. Let's go over the states of media codec. When you create a codec, it starts in the uninitialized state. First, you need to configure it. When you call start, the codec moves to the flushed state, where it holds all, all the buffers. As soon as you dequeue an input buffer, the codec moves to the running state. It spends most of its useful life here, processing input buffers, generating output. If you queue an input buffer with the end of stream flag, the codec moves to the end of stream state. Here, it no longer ac accepts further input buffers, but still generates output until the end of stream buffer is reached. You can move back to the flush state from any of the executing states by calling flush, or call stop to go back to the configured state. If you call reset from any state, the codec moves back to the uninitialized state. On rare occasions, the codec may encounter an error and moves to the error state. This is communicated using an invalid return value from a queuing operation, or sometimes via an, an exception. Call reset to make the codec usable again. After you finish using a codec, you have to release it by calling release. Boom. By default, codecs use byte buffers for both input and output data. However, video codecs can be configured to use hardware-accelerated surface buffers for raw video. This is the preferred mode to operate hardware-accelerated video codecs, as it allows them to work without memcopy. In either mode, media codec uses buffer indices to refer to buffers. You get the index of an empty input buffer by calling DQ input buffer. You can then fill the buffer with data, apply a timestamp or flags, and send it to the codec using Q input buffer. To get a filled output buffer, call DQ output buffer to get its index. Note how the timestamp is propagated from the input buffer. If using by buffers, you can then process the data and release the buffer by calling release output buffer. A couple of cautions. Although buffers are referred to by indices in a buffer array, not all indices may be valid, so there is really no indication of the number of buffers used. 
All output buffers are read-only. You should only access a buffer while you are holding onto it between DQ and Q or release buffer calls. Though buffers are handled asynchronously, release each buffer promptly. Doing otherwise may stall some codecs. As mentioned before, you can set up a vi video encoder to process hardware accelerated surface input. You do this by calling create input surface after configure. Pass this surface to the producer of the video frames, which will not directly talk to the codec. Similarly to the normal operation, the producer will request an empty, empty input buffer, fill it with data, apply a timestamp, and send it back to the codec for processing. When you want to stop the encoding session, call signal end of input stream to apply the end of stream flag to effectively the last frame received. Likewise, you can configure video decoders to use hardware accelerated output buffers by specifying an output surface in configure. Use the familiar DQ output buffer to get the index of a field output buffer. However, in contrast to byte buffers, you cannot inspect the contents of surface output buffers. You can only decide whether or not to send the buffer onto the output surface. To discard it, call release output buffer with render set to false, or set render to true to display the buffer on the output surface. In the L developer preview, we added support to optionally set the timestamp of a surface buffer about to be rendered. If set, some buffer consumers will wait for the timestamp to pass before using that buffer. We have recently added a few features to make Media Codec more useful. One of these, as demonstrated briefly before, is the ability to precisely schedule the display of video frames. Up until now, AVSync has been difficult to achieve. With the addition of surface timestamp support in Media Codec and high resolution timestamp support in Audio Track, this is not straightforward. Scheduling of video frames only works on surface view. Use the precise audio timestamp to calculate the exact system time when you want the video frame to appear on the display. Then set the timestamp by calling release output buffer about two vSync periods prior. The frame will be shown at the first vSync after the requested timestamp. Another recent improvement to Media Codec is the support for adaptive playback. Adaptive playback is an optional feature of video decoders that enables seamless change in resolution during playback, whereas the client can start to feed the decoder input video frames of a new resolution, and the resolution of the output buffers change automatically and without a significant gap. It is only supported if the codec is configured to use hardware accelerated surface buffers. If a codec does not support adaptive playback, you can still change the resolution. First, mark the last frame of the old resolution with an end of stream flag. Then wait until all frames are decoded. Then stop the codec, or simply flush it if using API level 19 or higher. Then configure it for the new resolution. Finally, start the codec again. Wow. And I used to think that was convenient. Before you can rely on the adaptive playback features, you need to verify that it is supported by the codec you are using by calling the isFeature supported uh, API. You, you enable adaptive playback during codec configuration using two special keys, max width and max height. These form a hint for the maximum resolution that has to be supported by the codec. If the configuration succeeds, the codec is expected to switch resolutions. Uh, the codec is expected to switch to resolutions smaller than the hint in a seamless fashion. Switching to larger resolutions is still possible dynamically, but it may not be seamless. Also, if you try to switch to a resolution that is not supported by the codec, it will enter its error state. A word of advice, to conserve memory, use the smallest resolution hint required for your use case. To change the video resolution while the codec is running, simply queue a sync frame using queue input buffer. A sync frame is a special keyframe that also contains the configuration change parameters. For H.264, this means that the SPS and PPS are supplied together with the IDR frame in a single buffer. Whew, that was a lot of information. We have published a streaming video player example on the developer website that demonstrates the use of the low-level APIs as well as adaptive playback. There's also a video by Ali that describes this sample in detail. Be sure to check them out. And for those of you who want more, the low-level media APIs are also available in the Android NDK. 
these C APIs mimic the Java ones and are available for both 32 and 64 bit native binaries. Sweet! With that, I must say farewell. I leave you with the challenge of building something fantastic for your users using the media building blocks. For more information, visit the Android developer website for API reference, guides, and sample applications. Thank you for your time.